ready to have a blast this morning. If you'll put out your listening guide, get you a Bible out. If you don't have a Bible, there's blue Bibles as you come in the door there, ways there on both tables. That is our gift to you. If you don't have one or maybe you have a translation that you can't read or that you can't understand, take one of those. Let that just be a gift. We are about the Bible, right? Let me remind you of why we're about the Bible this morning. We're about the Bible because the Bible is God's word to us, right? It reveals himself, it reveals our condition before him, and it reveals his plan to redeem us, right? So the Bible is important to us. We preach typically through books of the Bible, right? We go an Old Testament book, a New Testament book, back to an Old Testament book. Today we find ourselves in the book of 1 Timothy, a letter written by Pastor Paul, a seasoned senior pastor, to Timothy, a young pastor, right? He's been encouraging. He's given him uh, a difficult church setting in which to lead, and so he's helping mentor him as he leads that church. And so as we start this morning in 1 Timothy, we need to know this. The the overall arching theme of this book we learned in chapter 3, we've talked about it every week, is that the church would what? Would know how to behave, right? The church of God needs to know how God expects them to interact together, how they are expected to behave. There's a lot in the book thus far on good doctrine, right? We do not want to be a church that has bad teaching, satanic, demonic, false teaching. We want to be a church of good doctrine. The entire time we've talked about this is a blueprint. This book of the Bible is simply a blueprint to teach us how to design a church for God's what? Okay, two of you. Two of you have been here the whole series. For God's glory, right? For God's glory. Isn't that our heartbeat to be a church for God's glory? Yes, right? You're like, yes. We don't do this for fun, right? We don't do this because it's entertainment for me or for you. What we do as a church is very intentional. We have very strategic plans as a church. We design ourselves for His glory, right? And for His kingdom. That's why we do the things that we do. But this morning, before we get into here, not only has he talked a lot about false teaching, having good doctrine, he's also talked over and over and over again about what? Good, godly, biblical leadership, right? Specifically leadership within the church, right? Every church has to have some organized leadership. And today he's going to speak very specific to that. So we've learned previously in chapter 3, we learned about the qualifications for elders and deacons and some of those things. Today he's going to hone in on the elders, right? He's going to hone in on the elders. And he's going to teach us something from his word about how we should live interact with our elders, right? Some of you are thinking, well, this is odd coming from an elder, right? As a lead pastor, I'm one of the elders of the church. And so I'm going to share with you today what scripture talks about. Now, let me ask you this. Why do you think it is that he has spent so much time in this book already on biblical leadership? Why? Because it's important, right? We all know that organizations, we look at businesses, we look at let me, let me share this. Even in your home, I would challenge you with this. If you have good, godly, strong leadership in your home, your home will be a joy. It will be successful. It will be a home designed for God's glory, right? Same thing in any business. It needs good leadership. And, and many of you have worked for bad leadership, right? Some of you have worked in that condition. You're saying, it is a disaster. But some of you have worked for godly, incredible men and women and leaders in business. You say, it's, you know what, it's a joy to go to work, isn't it? It's a joy to interact together. I can trust them. I love them. They love me. They trust me. So this idea of leadership is a big idea for us in our lives. And in this book, it is a vital, vital idea when it comes to the body of Christ, his church. He speaks specific to this. So let's stand to our feet as we do every week and prepare to read 1 Timothy chapter 5. We will start at verse 17. Here's what he says in his word. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging. 
doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. How many of you thought, we're in for fun, right? You read that and you're like, this ought to be fun. It ought to. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we need your spirit with us today. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would not only be present, but that you would teach us today from your word. Lord, I pray, I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would allow me to be one of these type elders. I thank you for the other elders in our church that I believe with all of my heart. They are godly men who walk with you, who love you, who only want the best for your church. I thank you for them. I'm thankful and grateful to be a part of that team. Lord, I thank you for a church that loves their elders well, that respects their elders, Father. And I thank you for that. I pray again that you would teach us this morning. And it's in the name of Jesus that I ask. Amen. You may be seated. As we start in verse 17, it starts with a simple statement here, doesn't it? Let the elders who rule what? Who rule well. We can stop there for a minute. The sentence continues, but let's just stop there for a minute. The elders that rule well. How many... How many of you, don't raise your hand, right? But how many of you, as we started the process just several, a couple of years ago, really now, um, of organizing our church and and looking as as we redid all of our bylaws and how we structure, and we went through all of these things. We studied uh, church leadership in the scripture. We looked at all types of, we read together, we wrote papers together as a bylaws team. And, And many of you, for the first time, you didn't have any idea about elders. I heard comments like this. I had never uh, heard so much about elders in the Bible until you guys started talking about it. And then I was reading and it's like, on, it's all the time. Like almost every letter written talks about the elders and it just began to come alive to you. It's something that you just kind of missed over for years. But in this paragraph, in this sentence here, he, you know, he says that rules well. And the rules here is actually, you know what it means in the Greek? To rule, right? It's to be the overseer, the the final authority. And some of you, that rubs the wrong way, right? Some of you say one or two things. You say, well, I only want the senior pastor, the one pastor to be the final authority in the church. That's not what he says here. The the elders, it's plural here. And he's also going to tell us, some of you say, well, I I really want to see us all have a vote, right? Don't we live in America, right? In America, everyone has an equal vote. And so on the end of the day, the final decision, the final authority making body shouldn't be the elders it should be it should be the whole body right we should take a vote but how many of you know that as you look throughout scripture when the whole body got together and took a vote it really didn't turn out well right it really didn't turn out well this was not the design for scripture is to be led by elders who rule what well see we many of us we fear this because maybe you've sat under authority of elders who didn't rule well right But in this scripture, he's saying there should be some that rule well. And and, and to be an effective church and to be a church that's really and truly designed for God's glory, we've got to align ourselves with what scripture says. We must have elders that rule well. We must have those that have the final authority-making power to rule well. They must be godly. They must be humble. They must love not only the Lord, but they must love his church deeply. And I believe that ours here at this church, they love this church deeply. Now, he's listed the qualifications previously there. um, And I understand as we start this that not every church is as blessed as we are to have elders that rule well. I meet with a group of pastors uh, I have for a decade, right? The same group of pastors. And I listen to some of their discussions. And not only those, but just others in relationship that I'm with inside the community and outside the community as part of our convention and part of our association. And I can tell you, they don't all have elders that rule their churches well. Many churches really struggle with this. And, and some of you say, well, I came from a background where we had, you know, pastor only led church or we had deacon led churches and all of those things. And I'm not angry at them. I love, there are several churches, the churches that I've come out of who I love deeply and they're led by different groups other than the elders. And I'm not angry at them. But as we studied this together as a church and a bylaws team, we came to the conclusion that there's only one real example in scripture 
of how churches should be led. That's a plurality. That means multiple elders. Not just one. Not a group of deacons. But a group of elders. Again, I'm not angry at churches that do it differently, but this is the only model that we have in Scripture. There's not a, a bishop over our church, right? There's not, a, there's not a pope, right? We're not ruled by the pope. We're, we're, not, you know, we're not just going to take a majority vote on everything, right? There's some things we affirm, like the budget and you know, hiring a pastor and all of those things. But at the end of the day, we want to align ourselves up with what Scripture teaches. And I would ask you this. Think about how many of the churches you know are weak and anemic and the Spirit is not at work. Is it possible? Is it possible? possible that's because they're not structured as scripture has taught them to structure is it possible that leadership working in a godly leadership working in a godly manner produces power in the church today is that possible well we pray that God would use us don't we and we're not going to fight we're not going to you know argue over who rules at the end of the day I am submitting even myself to the elders yes I'm an elder but I am submitting myself to the authority of our elders some of the pastor friends thought I was nuts, right? They thought I was absolutely crazy. Because at the end of the day, you may or may not know this. At the end of the day, you don't fire me. Our elders would come together through a process. They can't like, hey, he's on vacation, right? Let's fire him. That'd be awesome. But through a process that's written and thought out and, and, and gives some time for God to work and gives some clarity, our elders through a process can bring me in, have discussion, council meeting, come into another meeting, and they can at the, at the end of that meeting, if need be, they can fire me. They can fire me. And it probably should be that way, right? And it won't destroy the church. It won't cause a big argument in the church because the elders are submitted to the church. And if they make a move like that, there is absolute reason for these godly men to pull the trigger and to make that move. I believe that with all my heart. I submit myself to the authority of the elder. Scripture teaches so much of that. It's so important in the church that I want us to spend time today looking at God's word and seeing right here what he says about the elders. And then it's also important because, you know, he's going to talk a lot about how we should treat our elders, isn't he? And we need to know that too. Now, again, it's hard coming from one of the elders to preach this message, right? It'd be awesome if somebody else was preaching the message and declaring, this is how we should treat our elders. It's a little more difficult for the elders to stay up and say, hey, here's what God's word says that you should treat us. But it's God's word, so we are going to teach it. He said this, be considered worthy of double honor. He's talking about the elders that labor, in, especially those that labor in preaching and teaching. You know what double honor means in the Greek? Some of you are catching on, right? You're like, you're a real, you're a real Greek student. I am. It really means double honor honor, right? Like all elders deserve honor, but there's other responsibilities and burdens that come for the one who preaches and teaches God's word week in and week out. So the first blank there for you, our elders are to be honored. They're to be honored. They are to be honored. So on upon our elder team, there are different roles among the elders, right? There's a couple of us that are preaching, teaching elders. So I'm the primary preaching, teaching elder, the lead elder here. And then Josh also preaches and teaches somewhere about once every six weeks or so. So there's this, there's this leadership that uh, by giftedness and by um, all of those things that each elder kind of has a role that they fit in with. You're going to see some more of that developed even over the next few weeks. But here's what I know about the elders of this church. They, we desperately love you. Do you know that? Amen. We love you. Did you know that we are concerned with your spiritual condition? We are deeply concerned with your spiritual life. We pray for you. We, we protect you. The things we discuss, the things we talk about are to protect you, to shepherd you, right? This idea of Jesus is the ultimate shepherd and, and he's our heavenly shepherd, but he's putting under shepherds here in the church to, to, to guard you and to protect you and to lead you and to shepherd you. That's our role and we take that role serious. There are sleepless nights that our elders spend over you. I don't know if you know this, but I wake up every single night, somewhere between three at 4 a.m. every single day. And you know what I do? I begin to pray. I just, I don't, I don't know. I, got, I, I used to ask God, why am I waking up, right? And I know Jim does too, and some of the other guys do. But I ask, why am I waking up to do this? Why can't I just sleep and get a good night's sleep? Well, at the end of the day, it's because I have the responsibility. You know what scripture teaches about the role, the responsibility, rather, of the elder? It's our responsibility. We have this burden, this responsibility, and we will stand before a holy God and give account for how we led you this body. 
So we pray for you. When we get together as elders, we pray. We pray for you specifically. We pray for you by name. We pray for your families. We pray for your situation. Before we go into any business or anything that needs to happen, we begin to pray for those who need prayer in our body. We want to be leading you and leading you well. We not only pray for you by name, but we spend that long, endless hours praying for you. I remember a season of life where this burden began to hit, right? It began to, to realize. I always thought it would be really cool to be a senior pastor, right? Until you are one. Then you go, wait a minute. There's a lot of responsibility here. It looks easy from over here. But when you sit in this new seat and you sense what Scripture is teaching and the, the responsibility that comes, and even I would call it a burden that comes for you and for your spiritual life and for your family and for the overall of this church, it begins to weigh on you. It begins to take its toll on you. I couldn't. There was a season of life, Jessica would tell you, I could not sleep hardly ever at all. I had gained a ton of weight. I was having just all kinds of issues. As a matter of fact, I finally, I was so, my head ached all the time. I had my eye was even twitching. Like it was just twitching away. I was like, what's going on? People were like, is he, is he winking at me? No, my eyes just twitching. I'm that stressed, right? That's all the things that are going on and the burden in my heart for, for our church and for you. And so I went to the doctor and I was like, you know, I, man, I don't know what's going on with me, right? The doctor is actually a military doctor. So we sat down together. My mom recommended him and spent time. And he was like, look, man, here's the deal. Your blood pressure's out of whack. Your adrenal glands and some of the other glands, they are fried, right? Your body is not processing stress anymore. What do you do for a living? I was like, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor of a church. He was like, <laughs> you're going to die, right? He said, you need to find a new job, right? So I spent time with him a couple years later. I was like, I'm just going to find a new doctor. I sat with a new doctor and he's like, what do you do for a living? And I was like, I'm a pastor. He laughed out loud too. He's like, <laughs> you need a new job, right? You're going you're to get yourself in shape. So the first doctor said, you need some supplements. We've got to get your body processing stress again. You fried your, your glands out. Let's take a lot of supplements. Let's do some exercises. Let's change your eating habits. Let's do some, some, some more, you know, in your prayer time, some more just meditation type things in your prayer times. Let's get you straightened out because he said this, his words were, you're not going to do this long at this rate. You're not going to do it long. And I begin to say, I, you know, God, I, I think you've called me to do this for the rest of my life. And I love this people. Help me. I need your help. And so through reading and study and beginning to intentionally put myself under his care and his leadership, I begin to get healthy, not only physically, but healthy mentally. And I'm telling you, I'm at one of the healthiest places I've ever been in my entire life at this point. Uh, but it's only under God's grace, right? The weightiness of being a pastor uh, is tough. High blood pressure's gone down. I'm feeling uh, incredible. I had all kinds. I went from having day terrors, right? Anybody have day terrors? They're miserable. Um, nightmares, all of those things to, to just been able to place my confidence in God. And he's really brought me through and healed me through a lot of those things. But I'll tell you, it was a very tough, tough place. I remember just being anxious. I remember Jessica, we'd be sitting at the table, me and Jessica and Lane, and we'd be talking or praying or whatever, and Jessica would be, she'd say, hello, right? Hello, because I'm in the room, I'm at the table, but I'm not paying any attention at all. I can't concentrate on what's going on, and, and it become almost like a little joke. Daddy's in the room, but he's not, he can't hear me, he's not listening. I was trying, but my mind was just, you know, flipped out so much that I couldn't even uh, listen and do that. So, you know, I had a choice to make. Got with the Lord, and, and I tell you all that not so you can feel bad for me, right? I don't want you to feel bad for me. I'd do it again for you, right? And I don't need you to feel bad for me. But I would tell you that because I want you to know this. I want you to know that as your lead pastor, I love you. I've committed myself to you. I've given everything that I can give to you. I've organized my entire life and my entire family to serve the best we can this body and this church. Everything we do as a family is with you in mind. Every decision we make, financial decisions that we're making is with you in mind to lead you well, to steward our finances well so you have someone to follow. Our prayer life is so that you can model everything we do. We want you to have some insight to and we pray that it is helpful to you to become more like Christ. Scripture says that you should make the life of your pastor a joy. Do you make it a joy? Most of you do, and I'm very thankful that you do that. But some, they preach publicly, they teach, and they're deserving of double honor. And you say, well, why? Well, here's the deal. It's hard, right? It's hard. Some of you think that preaching and teaching is actually easy, right? You think, I could do that. Sign me up. Let me do it. We put you up here. You're like, whoa, 
It's not that easy. We should just take turns and let you all do it. And then you go, we should pay him more, right? We should pay him more because the study and the prep and the laboring and then coming up here and delivering it in which, you know, not everyone's asleep, right? On the, on the first few rows there. I can see you, by the way. If you go to sleep, I can see you, right? It's someone pays the price. Either I label or labor over the sermon or you labor in listening. One of us has to labor. One of us has to pay the price. And if you talk a lot, if you preach a lot, here's the, th- the tough thing. The more you preach, the more dumb things you say, right? And that's just a reality. And so I get that. I understand that. But Deuteronomy says this. Um, he's actually quoting, I'm sorry, he's quoting Deuteronomy 25, uh, verse 4, I believe it is, in this next verse. So he's going back to the Old Testament when he says, For Scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Mm. So it was, it was this idea as the... As the the farmer had the ox and the ox was, was you know, grinding the grain and, and plowing the fields and all of those things. They would, they would muzzle the ox. You know why they muzzled the ox? Because the ox would then begin to eat the grain, right? He would, he would stomp through the grain. He would eat the grain as he was plowing. And they were, wait a minute, we can't do that. That would, that would take some of our grain. So, and what he's saying in Deuteronomy is that's not a good thing. You let your ox eat because he deserves it. He's the one that's doing the labor. He's the one that's doing the work, and he has the right to eat. And that's what he's saying. He's comparing that to the way to the to the to the pastors, to the elders. He's saying they do a lot of work. They uh, answer the phone calls. They t- study the scripture. They're the ones to guide you and counsel. They're the ones who do a lot of work, and he's simply saying they're worth their wages, right? Some of you come out of a background where you think the pastor should be poor, right? Some of you come out of that background. You're like, you know, you, they, you heard it. We'll keep our pastor poor so he stays humble. That's dumb, right? That's not what Scripture is saying here. And some of you come from that background. Now, some of you come from the opposite extreme, right? Some of you come out of a very charismatic background or, you know, one of those um, prosperity gospel backgrounds, right? And you're like, we should buy our pastor a jet, That's not coming out of Scripture either. So I should neither be poor and looking for food uh, or flying a jet, right? There's got to be somewhere in the middle for your pastor to live, right? And that's the place in which we live there. He says he deserves his wages. I do pray that, though, that we would be a good example for you, that we would be generous. Um, You know, here's what it does. You guys are committed to paying me enough that I'm not concerned about my fan finances and my family so I can do the work of God. That's what you do. That's our commitment as a church. We want to make sure that, that I am financed enough that I don't have to concern myself as much with my finances. As long as I'm stewarding well, I don't have to concern myself and worry where the next meal's coming from or worry where my kid's college fund, right, starting now, is, is going to come from. So you guys do a good job of that. I appreciate that. Number two on your listing, God, is elders should be protected. So elders should be honored, and then number two, elders should be protected. What's it say? Do not admit a charge against an elder except for the evidence of two or three witnesses. How many of you have met people that just got mad at the pastor, right? Did you know every once in a while... Somebody gets mad at the pastor, right? He preaches a lot. He says things. He, you know, hopefully it lines up with God's word. Some of you are like, I don't really like what God has to say to me. So I'm going to be mad at the deliverer of the mail, right? I didn't write the mail. I just delivered it. Some of you didn't like the mail that was delivered to you. And you're like, I'm going to be mad at the pastor. And this happens. This happens, thankfully, not here at Crossway, but it happens in other churches where people just get mad about the pastors. And you know what some people do when they're mad at the pastor? They lie about their pastor. Right? They demean him. They want to ruin his name. They want to run him off. And that's what he's talking about here. We should not allow the haters. And because what is God? He tells us so clear in his word. He hates liars. He hates deceivers. That is of Satan. Right? That's of the enemy. But when God's people in his own church begin to do that, it is satanic and it is demonic and it is not a good thing for the glory of God or the church, right, at all, or even for the pastor. So it's very specific here. If you have an accusation against the pastor, you should have two or three witnesses that agree on that and then come. So if you have a problem, an issue, if you see me doing something boneheaded, uh, which I pray you never have to do this, right, that's my prayer. But if you do, then you would gather two or three of you who have not only just heard the other person and talking about it, but have witnessed it. Maybe two of you have come and confronted and we had a discussion and we looked and or you, you caught me or saw or whatever it was. Then once two or three of you come to the elders, you would present your case, right? In other words, the elders shouldn't have to turn around every time that you don't like something that I do and listen to you just gripe about what I do, right? That's not what it's saying. It says you should protect and love your elders. 
Now, there is an occasion where, you know, people, again, make major mistakes and they disqualify themselves and we have a process as God's church to deal with that. I, again, I pray and I hope that we never have to go there. How many of you are with me? I never want to go there. So be praying for me and for the other elders, but it should be handled very seriously. I want you to get this. When you charge an elder, it is a very serious charge. Don't take it lightly. Take it serious. Take it serious. It affects not only uh, the elder himself, but it affects the entirety of this body. And it also affects the elder for the rest of his ministry, right? I mean, even he goes to another church or something, you know what they do? They call back to this church and they say, well, tell me about so-and-so. And they say, well, and then the story begins to come out. And so what we do, here's, I've, I've personally known guys whose ministry is, was absolutely tarnished and destroyed and ruined. And they are out of ministry full time now. And you know why? Because someone lied about them. I do. I know them. And it keeps me up at night sometimes. It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? So you need to be praying for and protecting your pastor. How can you honor and protect your pastor? I'm going to give you some ways that you can do that this morning. How many of you are like, it is weird for you to tell me how to do that since it's about you, right? Somebody's like, amen, back there. But here's some ways that you can, and it's on your listening, guys, some ways that you can honor and protect your pastor. Squelch gossip and criticism of them. I, that's a blessing. Let me just tell you. That's a blessing, right? If you get in your groups or you get in someone's home or whatever it is. Or here, here's the thing. It doesn't even come out of this body. You want to know where the most criticism is going to come from of your pastor? Not from this body. From somebody else. From your neighbors that go to a different church. Right? The ones that go to a different church. They're going to kind of nickname us. I knew a church in town here that nicknamed all the churches, right? And the pastor would yell about them and how they listen to Christian rock music. And so they definitely certainly go into hell. And they're not really good Christians. And, you know, all those things. And he would name the churches. And then he would nickname them, right? He would demean them by nicknaming them. I'm not going to tell you what they are. But they're kind of funny, but really not funny, right? It's really not a funny thing to do. So if you see gossip or criticism of your pastor or your elders, just, just, just quit it. Just quit it. Just be sure to, to speak into that. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go. The second thing you can do is speak well of them, right? Again, have you not seen that, that in this scripture it's, it's, it's saying that the, the, the elders are the ones that are laboring on your behalf, right? They're the ones that are praying over you, and they're the ones that are praying for you, and they're the ones that you call when you have an issue, and they're the ones that are counseling. They're the ones that are teaching God's word. They're the ones that are organizing and leading the church. And so if that's the case, then speak well. Of them. There's nothing better than going with someone, walking with someone into a place of business or whatever it is, and they say, this, this is my pastor. This is my pastor. And they're proud with a smile on their face, like, this is my pastor. I want to introduce you to my pastor, right? Being in the hospital room with you and sitting with you and, you know, just your, hey, there's the nurses or doctors coming in. You say, this, this is my pastor. This is my pastor. And they're all like, wow, I thought pastors were old, right? Like, I'm getting there. I'm catching up. I'm getting there. Just give me some time. The third thing you can do is guard, protect, and speak well of, you get this, guard, protect, and speak well of their family, of their family. You want to get on your pastor's good side, talk well about my wife, right? Talk well about my little girl, right? Because here's, here's the thing, they have to have the freedom to sin. Did you know that my daughter still is an eight-year-old, like a normal, everyday eight-year-old like yours? right? She's like yours. She smiles a lot, right? And she puts on a friendly face and she's happy, but she still does silly, sinful things that have to get, you know, discipline from daddy, right? Just like your kids do. So if you could show my daughter and my wife a little grace, right? She's, my wife is not going to do everything right. She can't be everything for everyone. And I know so many pastor's wives that just totally exhaust themselves trying to please Everyone. She can't do everything within this church. We were in the nursery this morning. She happened to be on, the, on several rotations today alone. My wife was a uh, greeter this morning. She was in the nursery this morning. And she had children's church this morning, right? Not all by herself. There's teams and she's on different teams. But it just happened to line up all once a month. It happens that way where there's one Sunday where she has those three things. Look, she loves you. She is some committed to you and she loves you. If you can speak and raise her up and lift her up, that would mean so much to me. That would mean more that, that you did that than it would mean to me. And the truth be told, there are days where i like, I don't even know if I'm cut out for ministry. It's tough. You know who kept me here? My wife. 
She said, but God has called you. You are gifted for this. And this is one of the greatest churches on the face of the planet. That's what she thinks of you. I'll tell you this little secret too. If my wife hated you, I'd be out of here. <laughs> I'd go to another one. I'd go to another one. But she loves you. She's in relationship with you. It's not a fight. It's not drudgery for her to be here. It's not a fight to get my eight-year-old daughter to be here. It's not drudgery for her to be here. She loves you. And part of that is because you have loved her so well. And I thank you for that. Pray for, pray for your pastor. Uh, this is another way. Number four, pray for your pastor and for their family, right? Pray for their spiritual walk, right? Maybe you leave this church and you're somewhere else and you, I hope you're going to apply these same things. Pray for our spiritual walk, right? Pray that every morning when we wake up and we get into the word that God would reveal himself to us more. He would speak afresh and anew to us. You know, the biggest fear is that I would just get so good at this that I can come up here and speak without it actually being a part of my life, right? It's a sad reality for many. It's a sad reality. But pray not only for my spiritual walk, but pray for wisdom, right, and decision-making and discernment. Pray for that. Pray for energy, right? It takes a lot of focus and a lot of energy. Pray that God would give me and my family focus and energy to serve you well. Number five, extend them grace, right? I am, and, and I'll speak more to myself than, than my family. I've already shared about my family and how that would mean to me if you extended grace for sure to them. But you know, I need your grace sometimes, right? You know, sometimes I'm having a bad day. I do. And my phone rings off the hook, right? It rings off. The, I'm charging it two and three times a day, right? So that tells you something. And so if you look at my, my um, you can go on my phone and look at how many hours that you spent on it. It's a lot, right? It's ridiculous really how much. But again, I do that because I desperately, I love you and my family's committed to you. Even when I have those days where I'm like, I don't even want to answer it. My wife's like, just answer it. Just answer it. It's just people. It's our people. Just answer it, you know? Love on them a little bit. Listen to them. Pray for them. Whatever it is. I'm like, I'm tired. You know, she's like, this is, this is a, a good thing. And so just showing some grace. I don't always say um, the wisest thing. And I sometimes need your grace. Sometimes I'm tired, right? Sometimes I'm dumb, right? That just happens. Sometimes I'm, I'm still young and there's some things that I'm not as wise in as I hope to be in maybe 10 or 15 years, right? I'm growing wiser every year. There are some things that you're just going to have to look at your pastor and say, you know what? I'm just going to show him some grace. I'm going to choose grace. I'm going to choose grace. I desperately need uh, oftentimes for you to choose grace. Number six, another way you can serve your pastor is protect their time off uh, and their family time. Look, here's the deal. I'm off. I, I love, I like working, right? It's weird. I actually like to work. I put in a lot of hours a week. I'm always thinking. I'm always praying. I'm always studying. I'm always serving. I'm always calling. I'm always meeting with. I'm always doing these things because I enjoy this. I, this is my calling. But on Thursdays, I try my very best to put it down right? On Thursday, it's my new day off. As a family, we go because we're committed. We go to a Bible study, a community Bible study together as a family, as, as, as the three of us. And we spend the first several hours, first about three hours there of just studying. So we eat breakfast together at home on Thursdays. We spend some time together. We get dressed. We go to study the scripture, right? And we do that together as a family. We have lunch together. We talk through that and we just spend the day together on Thursday. That's our reconnect as a family day. And you can help me. You can protect uh, that time for me and just call me like on Tuesday or Wednesday, right? You can just help with some of that. But now you know my day off is Thursday. And if you want to protect my family time and my, my time with them, you can help by doing that. Number six, seven. Number seven, this one is, this is so important. Share your story of growth and change. Can you share your story of growth and change? You know what motivates me to continue to do this all the time? Is that I hear your stories. I hear who you once were. I hear all that God is doing in your life, and it motivates me. It gets me psyched up, right? When I'm down, I start to pull out a list of cards, and even some of the children have made things, of, and, and some of the youth, and all those things, and I pull some of those things out, and I look through them, and, and I, I still, I have, you know, some of you written me emails, or you've written me different cards, and you said, you know what, you've helped me through this. Here is how my life has changed, and I keep those things, and I look at those things. That's what keeps me motivated. Here's what you need. You need to share those things. We love as pastors, as elders, to hear that God is using in our ministry for your good, right? Those prayers that we've prayed for you, it's amazing to hear how these, he's answered those prayers that we've joined in 
and prayed for you. I always hear the bad, right? I always hear the bad. It's good to hear some of the good. And then finally, the eighth thing is to, to follow his leadership. All right, if you've got a godly pastor, a godly man who loves you and serves you, why don't you follow his leadership, right? If he spends time with the Lord and you know he does and, he, and he's committed to you and he's committed to him and he's committed to, to wisdom and he's, he's spent a lot of time whenever the pastor speaks and asks you for something or asks you in a direction, why would you not follow his leadership, right? He's not trying to, I'm not trying to lead you into a ditch, right? Most anything that I say or communicate has already crossed through the wisdom of the plurality of elders, right? I don't just get up here and pitch something without it going through. These guys have prayed through it. They've discussed through it. There's a lot of things that I could bring to, and they're like, nope, that's dumb, right? And I need to hear that. There's a lot of things where we change things or, you know, all of those things because it's the wisdom of going through there. So once it's vetted through there, then maybe you can just follow the leadership. I think that's what Scripture would have us do, right? So what if there is an accusation against an elder, right? The two or three come together. There's an accusation that's made against an elder. Here's the Scripture teaches us what we need to do. You know, number three, elders are to be rebuked. Elders be rebuked. We're not God. We're not sinless. We're not untouchables, right? Some churches have held their pastor to the standard. They're, they're almost sinless, right? They're, they're a little God. And we, we bow down and submit ourselves to the little gods. That is not what Scripture teaches. And that is not the way that you should treat your elders here in this body. There are occasions, sadly, where elders need to be rebuked. What does verse 20 say? And for those who persist in sin, what? Rebuke them. Rebuke them. Rebuke them. If we're persistent in our sin and we've not addressed it and you've seen it and you've brought it up, then it's time for an elder to be rebuked. And that's a sad day. But you know what? If that uh, needs to happen, if there's a, an occasion, if the elders are misbehaving and they're sinning and they're persistent, it needs to be brought up. It needs for the good of the church and for most importantly, the glory of God. It needs to be it needs to be addressed. Sadly, many churches are not addressing it. They're not addressing it. They, they don't think that they can rebuke an elder. And the scripture says that this should be done. As a matter of fact, it says it should be done publicly. There, And why should it be done publicly? And he adds here in the scripture, so that the rest may stand in fear. The rest may stand in fear. The idea is if you're even going to rebuke an elder, if the church has to rebuke an elder for their persistent sin, everyone else will look and say, well, if the church, if the other elders are serious about that and that doesn't get to fly, then I know that they're serious about God's glory. They're serious about what they say and that they can stand in, in reverence, in awe, and in fear. And it should be that way. I can think of too many cases where the elders knew that the, I can tell you one right now, if I mentioned his name, he's the uh, grandson of a very, very popular pastor and evangelist. And he was having an affair. And his elder board knew it. They knew it. And you know what they did? They did nothing. They did nothing. Nothing. Month after month after month after month after month went by. Finally, there was so much against him accusation wise that they didn't have a choice that he finally resigned on his own should that have happened should that have disgraced the church and disgraced a holy god that should never ever happen it's happened in the largest southern baptist church in our nation today out of south carolina the pastor one of the elders the elders were meeting and the pastor had persistently began to drink too much alcohol it had been brought to his attention through the other elders his wife was even on board with it they had discussion after discussion after discussion and you know what he thought i pastored i built the largest southern baptist church i can pretty much do what i want to i deserve the right to do it and you know what they had to do they had to look at him and fire the pastor that built the largest southern baptist church in our nation and rightly so, by the way. The church suffered. It was tough. It was a tough decision. There's still some ripple effects from that. But you know what? God has honored that and the church is still very successful. Has a strong pastor. Has a strong elder team. And they're very successful for the kingdom. For the advancement of the kingdom. Now, that is a difficult decision to make. But it says in scripture that they should, they are not above rebuke. They're not above rebuke. 
And he says, how serious is it? In the presence of God and Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Rebuking an elder is serious. It's serious. And we should not, um, we should not look that lightly. Number four, elders are to be vetted, right? Some of you are like extreme vetting, right? For elders, there should be, whether you stand politically when it comes to people coming in our country, none of that matters. When it comes to elders... They must be extremely vetted. Do you know that? Right? We should be hard. It says here, don't be hasty to the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. What this means when it says the laying on of hands in Scripture, this is the laying on, the commissioning of an elder. The church would come around. They would lay hands on the elder. They would pray for him. They would recognize God's calling and giftedness in his life to be an elder, and they would commission him to serve as their elder. And he's saying, here's the deal. Don't do that too fast. Be slow about it. Make sure that he's a godly man who has been tested, that he is the right man for the job, right? How many of you know of churches who they they got elders who they should not have gotten? As a matter of fact, I would say this, even in the book of 1 Timothy, the reason why he's addressing so much of this is because the elders weren't doing their job, right? They quickly laid hands too quickly on the elders and commissioned them to be their elders. And the church was suffering. Even, Even some of the elders were beginning to teach false doctrine, right? Some of you say, that's bad, right? They were too quick to lay on of hands. So we were very slow in our elder selection process. There's an incredibly long process there in selecting elders, right? They actually write a paper on doctrine. They fill out several questions, a questionnaire on doctrine that requires a lot of writing, right? So we know where they are theologically in some of their doctrine there. We have their written testimony. The elders had to write their testimony of their life change and what that looked like for them, and they submitted that. Then they had to go to a a weekend retreat, right? And in retreat, we had a training retreat where we looked at Scripture, and really, we probably had 40 or 50 pages, didn't we, Tom, of reading materials before getting there, right? And then when we got there, we spent processing through more and more and more and more. I can't remember how many pages that we've read and studied as a group of elders on what it means to be an elder. And then they went through this series of reference checks, right? We're background checking them. They not only had to do a background check, but we had to have references. They turned in their references. We phone called their references. We checked to see are they men, godly men of character, even uh, outside of their families. We did that. We did personal interviews. So we gathered teams up and we sat with the, the candidate, elder candidates and we talked to them through the the team had to ask them all of the questions. We, we personally interviewed every elder. As a matter of fact, we also had a written spousal interview, right? Some of you think, that's a little, that's a little far, right? We're, we're, we're questioning their wives, right? Do they live this at home, right? Are they talking a good talk here? Or is this how they believe and how they live in their homes? So we say, that's, that's pretty far. Well, this is because Scripture says you don't want the wrong men ruling, overseeing, and leading this body. Be slow. Be intentional. Some of you say, man, the process back then, I just thought it was absolutely crazy. But at the end of it, aren't you grateful that we took our time and have five godly men who love the Lord and who love you, who love their family, serving as leader of this church? Mm. Most churches lay, them on, lay hands on too, too quickly. Too quickly. Here's how I want us to end. I want us to end with this. I want to end asking you to honor, to protect, if need be, to rebuke the elders of this church. But I'll tell you where it starts. It starts with your prayers.